Let's move on to topic four, which is probability. Now, probability is quite a long topic. Okay, uh, we began this topic by uh, learning again the definition of a variable, particularly a random variable. What this means is uh, whenever we conduct an experiment in the social science, the outcome of our experiment is known as the random variable, which means we cannot control it. So whatever it is, the outcome that we get, it is due to chance. So it's random. Okay. And then we learned about the probability distribution concept. Probability distribution is basically a list, you know, distribution. A list of what? A list of all of the random variables uh, and their respective uh, probabilities that's attached to each and every one of those outcomes or random variables. Okay, so now the probability distribution depends. It could be a discrete probability distribution. It could be a continuous probability distribution here. So how do we know if it's discrete or continuous? Well, it depends on the random variable. If the random variable is discrete in nature, therefore the probability distribution is a discrete probability distribution. If the random variable is continuous in nature, then we will have a continuous probability distribution. Now let's focus on the discrete probability distributions first. Now, since the discrete probability distribution is our random variable, it's our x now, uh, so we know that whenever there's a random variable, we can always find the average and the dispersion for it, right? So that is why for this discrete probability distribution, uh, please know how to find the mean and standard deviation, all right? Um, if you may recall in one of our video lectures, there's a table, um, and then we can, from that table, we can calculate each probability for a particular um, occurrence, right? And then we can also calculate the mean or the average and the standard deviation for that particular discrete probability distribution. There are two special types of discrete probability distribution. The first is the binomial distribution. Okay, so recall what are the four characteristics of the binomial distribution. From the word binomial or bi, there are two outcomes of the experiment. One is success, one is failure. Okay, so the success is basically our x or our random variable. So x here is basically the number of success. That is our first characteristic. Okay, and then the second characteristic is the probability of this success denoted as pi. The probability of success is fixed. Uh, okay, and then the third characteristic is there's also a fixed number of trials, or we can call it also the sample size. And finally, there's an independence between the outcomes of one trial and the outcomes of another trial. Okay, so remember, those are the four characteristics of the binomial distribution. And since now our random variable follows a binomial distribution, we can also find the mean, okay, and the variance and standard deviation of this binomial distribution. Besides the mean and variance, we can also find the probabilities. So please remember the formula to calculate the binomial distribution and also the second way to find the probabilities by using the table. Okay? The second special type of discrete probability distribution is the Poisson distribution. Okay? So just like binomial, it also has a special characteristic. Okay? Uh, while the binomial distribution is more focused on the number of success, Poisson here is focused on the number of occurrences, okay? The main difference between Poisson and binomial is that uh, for Poisson, we have intervals, okay? Meaning that for every random variable that follows the Poisson distribution, we need to know what is the interval. Is it per day, per minute, per match, or whatever, okay? So whenever we have that interval, we can identify the rate at which something occurs within the interval. So the rate is basically the, um, the mu, lah the average. Now, since our random variable now follows the Poisson distribution, we can find the mean, we can find the variance, and of course, we can also find the probabilities. Now, for each and every one of these, please know the respective formulas. Now, let's move on to the continuous probability distribution now. Uh, we only learned one type of continuous probability distribution, which is the normal distribution, so it's relatively simple. Okay, please know the characteristics of the normal distribution. Okay. Remember, it's um, symmetrical, meaning that there's only one peak, and at that peak, we have the mean, median, and mode. All right, it's, it's uh, equals, and it's asymptotic, and um, there's basically a lot of normal distributions, okay? Each normal distribution is characterized by the mean and the standard deviation. 
So since there's a family of normal distributions, uh, of course we need to know how can we solve the probability question, right? So that is why we learned the standard normal. What that means is in order for us to solve a normal distribution probability question, we have to convert or change all of the x values to become z. Okay, once we convert all the x to z, then we can use the normal table, and then only we can solve the probability questions. Okay? Okay, let's zoom out a bit. So let's focus again. What's important under normal distribution? Number one is, of course, the characteristics. Secondly, we need to understand why it's important for us to standardize all of our x values into z, okay? Why? Again, I repeat, it's because we want to use the normal table in order to solve the probability question. Okay, if you look at the normal table, there's no x values there, it's only z. So that's why you need to change all of the x to z first. Okay, one, two, and three. Of course, once we know how to standardize, we can find probabilities. And then four, sometimes instead of asking us to find the probabilities, the question can also ask us to find the value of x. In other words, they give us the probability, we need to find x. So this is basically working backwards. And finally, we also learned the normal approximation to the binomial. This one is basically, um, it's a binomial question. Okay, guys, remember binomial here? Yes, this binomial, that means you need to know the four characteristics first in order to determine it is binomial. So it's a binomial question. But... Uh, since it meets the condition, which is a very large sample size, what are the conditions? The condition is n pi more than 5. Oops. And n times 1 minus pi is more than 5. Okay, when these two conditions are met, what we can do is we can use the normal distribution to solve the binomial question. All right? Moving on to topic 5, sampling methods or sampling distribution of sample mean and the central limit theorem. Now in this topic, it's basically divided into two parts. The first is we learned about the different sampling methods or how to collect sample. Our main focus is on the probability um, sampling methods, okay, uh, which are these four. The first is simple random sampling, followed by systematic random sampling, stratified random sampling, and cluster sampling. So please know um, how to conduct each and every one of them, what are the benefits, what are the disadvantages, all right? And besides knowing how to collect samples using these sampling methods, you're also introduced to the concept of sampling error. Okay, so what's sampling error? Remember guys, there's a difference between population and sample. Right? Population is basically the whole thing, the entire universe, okay? Sample is just a part of that population. So obviously, whatever information we get from the sample is called the sample statistic, okay? So there will be a difference between the sample statistic and the population parameter. That difference is called the sampling error. Okay, so I've already mentioned to you before, since there's a difference or since there is sampling error, how can we make sure that all of our, uh, you know, results of the study make sense or reliable? So the easiest way to do so is to come up with a sampling distribution of sample mean. What this means is it's as if we conduct the sample or the study multiple times, you know, many, many times. So we can find a distribution or a list of all of the sample means that we could have gotten if we have done the study uh, repeatedly. Okay, so here for the sampling distribution of sample mean, we've learned the concept of, here, where am I going to write it down? We've learned the concept of here. This is the mean of the sampling distribution of sample mean. But then, according to the central limit theorem, it's equivalent to mu. That is why we don't usually write it this way, we just write it as mu, okay? Okay, so this is the central tendency. And then for the dispersion, we also learned about standard error. Remember standard error is just the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of sample mean, okay? But the standard error is not equals to standard deviation, right? In fact, the standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n, okay? So why is this too important? Because... All right. When we want to solve probability questions, we need to convert. Again, we need to convert, but this time we need to convert all of the x bars into z. Just now, up here, we converted or we changed all of the x values to z. Because last time, in this question, x is our random variable. If we studied this part, our random variable is are all of the averages. 
Okay, so again, we need to convert either the x or the x bars into z. Then only we can use the normal table to solve the question. So here, see, x bar minus mu. This mu is actually the mean of the sampling distribution of sample mean. Okay, and divide by the standard error. So that's the mean difference. So please know when to apply. Where am I? Okay, please know when to apply this standardizing formula or this standardizing formula. I repeat, you use this if you're dealing with averages. We use this if you're dealing with x. And then in topic 6, we learned about confidence interval. There are generally two confidence intervals that we learned, okay? We learned how to construct the confidence interval for the population mean. And we learned how to construct the confidence interval for the population proportion. Now, for both of these cases, the general formula is the same, which is point estimate plus minus margin of error. See? Here also. Point estimate plus minus the margin of error. Point estimate refers to the sample statistic that we use to estimate the population parameter. For instance, here, our population parameter of interest is mu. This is basically what we want, okay? But we know that it's impossible for us to get mu because the only way to get mu is to do a census. But since we, it's difficult to get access to the entire population, uh, that is why we conduct a sample, okay? So the best estimate for mu is the x bar. So that is why... Our point estimate here is x bar, which is the best estimate for the mu. All right. And then plus minus. Why plus minus? Because we're finding a, an interval. Interval means there's a plus and minus, okay, from the center. Remember, x bar is the center, right? Mean. Mean can the mean is the central tendency. So we want the, the dispersion. Plus minus margin of error. Now, margin of error consists of two parts, right? One is the confidence level which is Z. Another one is your standard error. Standard error is basically what? Sigma over square root of N. Okay, so that is why the formula for confidence interval is X bar plus minus Z, oh, where am I? X bar plus minus Z times sigma over square root of N. Now, this basic formula changes depending on the situation. If we have a large sample size and we know sigma, this is the formula we use. Okay, if you have a large sample size but we don't know sigma, we just substitute sigma with S. Okay, now if you have a small sample size, we cannot use Z altogether. Okay, what we need to use is T. So if you have a small sample size, the formula becomes X bar plus minus T times S over square root of N. Okay, so anyway, all right, I'm not really concerned about the formulas because you have the formula with you. You can always refer to it whenever you attempt something. What's more important is the concept. Okay, you need to know why we use this for certain certain cases. Now, moving on to the next confidence interval, which is to find the confidence interval for uh, pi. See, again, the same formula applies. Point estimate plus minus the margin of error. But this time around, since our population parameter is pi, we cannot use x bar lah. So what is the point estimate for pi? It's p, okay? That's why it's p here. Plus, minus, plus, minus. What's the margin of error? Again, it consists of two, yeah? The level of confidence and the standard error. The level of confidence is still z. Okay, but this time, uh, the standard error is square root of p times 1 minus p over n. Okay, so again, all of these formulas you can find in the formula booklet. What I want you to focus on or to pay attention more is on the concept. So you cannot use x bars and standard deviation. You cannot use mean. You cannot use sample mean and sample standard deviation for proportion questions. You need to use sample proportion. Okay. So basically, we learned how to find confidence interval for mu, confidence interval for pi, and the third application is basically uh, finite population correction factors. Now, the difference is here. When we calculated these two cases before, we don't know what the population size is. In other words, our population was infinite, very large. But sometimes you are given the population sizes. You know, when we deal with this question, we need to you know, apply the correction factor, which is called the finite population correction factor, or uh, FPC. Okay, so the FPC is basically... The FPC is basically the population size minus sample size over the population size minus 1 square root.
So what we need to do is we need to take this FPC and just include it to the original formula. Specifically, we need to attach it. Okay, we need to attach this FPC with the standard error. We put it here behind the standard error. This one, we put it behind here. We put it behind here and we put it behind here. Okay, again, please refer to your lecture notes. And finally, in topic 6, we learned how to calculate or to determine the appropriate sample size. All this while, the n was given to us, now we need to find n. Again, it depends on the question. Whether they ask you to find the appropriate sample size for estimating the population mean, or to find the n uh, to estimate the population proportion. So there are two formulas, okay, to determine the appropriate sample size. One is this one, z times sigma over e square root. Okay, we use this formula where we want to find the appropriate sample size uh, when this question is for population mean. The second formula is n equals to p times 1 minus p times z over e squared. Okay, so we use this uh, formula to find sample size when the, prob when the problem is for proportions. Okay, so um, you don't really need to know how to derive these formulas because it's given to you. Just know when to use which formula, okay, in which circumstance.